uh, after today going. Ah, yes, we're recording. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the future of urban AI season two. We are after today going to be halfway through uh, our program for the season. Um, as you may recall, we are continuing our exploration of the future of urban tech uh, forecasts produced by my group at the Urban Tech Hub at Cornell Tech uh, back in 2021. Um, and this has really been the roadmap for our exploration with Urban AI and Uber uh, as we um, investigate the, the places where AI is really playing an important role in shaping the future of urban technology. Um, and uh, this is really a continuation of uh, the spots on this, this map that we, we didn't cover last year. Today, we uh, are welcoming Charlie Catlett, who's Senior Computer Scientist at Argonne National Laboratory, also a Senior Fellow at the University of Chicago's Monsueto Institute for Urban Innovation. And I really uh, can't think of a better person to help us understand the many questions around how and why we might embed AI in future cities. Uh, Charlie was a pioneer, been a pioneer in network computing for nearly 40 years. Uh, from the days of NSFNet, one of the precursors to what we now think of as the internet in, in the 1980s, uh, as well as the very well-known Array of Things project at the University of Chicago's Urban Center for Computation, which he founded in 2012. Charlie's current research focuses on the design and use of sensing and AI the edge computing technologies embedded in urban infrastructure and the environment and this notion of software defined sensing, which is the topic of today's conversation. So let me welcome Charlie to the stage. And as you have questions, feel free to share them in the chat. I uh, will also have time at the end uh, for you to come on screen and, and ask them yourself. Over to you, Charlie. Thank you, Anthony. I'm just gonna pull up my slides here. Yeah, so um, I want to just spend the next 20 minutes or so giving you a, a quick overview of what we have been doing since about 2011 or so and why we began to put artificial intelligence into embedding into devices in the city of Chicago. We went to other cities as well. We've got the devices around the world, but um, most of our work has been focused in, in Chicago. And then from there, tell you sort of where we are with the technology and and what our thinking is in terms of urban systems and the use of AI um, in cities and some, uh, some things that uh, we have sort of learned over the years and how to work in cities um, with this sort of um, uh, research technology. On the screen here, you can see the logos of all the uh, you know, main partners, Northwestern University has been very heavily involved in all of these things. And then the uh, support has come from the National Science Foundation, City of Chicago, um, and the Department of Energy. Um, Argonne, is a na Argonne National Laboratory is a, um, is a Department of Energy Science Laboratory. And we're just outside of Chicago. So we've, we've led a number of initiatives, um, many small activities, but then some major initiatives over the last 10 years or so the first of which Anthony mentioned, which is the Array of Things project. That was a computer science experiment. We were hopeful that we could do something that would be useful to um, policymakers and sociologists and in other uh, uh, areas of, of work. Our devices were designed collaboratively from uh, based on a number of different workshops that we did with different science communities. And um, we did quite a bit of collaboration with the city of Chicago and and uh, leaders in Chicago neighborhoods, as I'll as I'll mention. But this was the first one, and we put up about 150 devices throughout the city, which I'll I'll expose what those devices are in a moment. And the questions that we had were, you know, whether we could actually build a reliable computer system that would be up on a pole. These are about eight to nine meters above above the above grade, um, and, so, and so we don't have access to them physically. So we thought about different ways to, um, you know, with a computer, you need to reboot it sometimes and, and you know, or maybe kick it or, or do other things. 
And so we thought about clever things like maybe uh, putting a garage door opener receiver so we could reboot the machines. And um, so a lot of the work was really focused on um, on the resilience of the computer science, the, the, the system. Um, the next project that, that has followed on from the array of things, you can see we have a couple dozen devices up now, uh, mostly replacing those um, array of things devices where we already have the wiring there. These are devices that have to have power all the time. And here we really um, beefed up the computing capabilities of the devices so that we could do some of the things we envisioned 10 years ago, such as flood detection or even eventually detecting a near miss of a collision between vehicles or a vehicle and a pedestrian or a vehicle and a in a bicycle. Then um, I was approached by Microsoft about two, two and a half years ago. Was, um, uh, they wanted to do a project in, in air pollution sensing. Our devices, as I'll show you, have lots of different sensors and cameras. They were just focused on air pollution and wanting to do something that uh, would would reflect the, the, the uh, disparate impacts of air pollution on communities in Chicago. So not that we would only measure those communities, but we would do a sort of mix of devices that would give us the big picture across the city, but oversample in those places where um, uh, where we knew that there were uh, issues with pollution. So this was a project that uh, uh, we brought in JC to co. They run 2,500 bus shelters throughout Chicago with power uh, in more than half of them. So we ended up with this, uh, uh, these red uh, triangles that I'm putting up with this configuration of, um, of these uh, devices uh, throughout the city. We learned among other things that the location of bus shelters does not necessarily um, reflect an equity across uh, neighborhoods. Uh, there are some neighborhoods that don't have the uh, public transit, uh, the buses that uh, that we would have liked, but this was at least a good first approximation. And we've uh, written a couple of papers on this project, one of which deals with the technology itself and the process that we went through to deploy the devices. The other is a much more in-depth paper um, where we go into the strategies for partnership with communities in the city of Chicago in the title, which I don't have memorized, it's a three-legged stool. We we talk about the need for these kind of projects to have um, participation, not just from technologists, but also from um, policymakers in the city and from communities. And without those three sort of pillars of participation, these projects are uh, are 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 not going to be as successful as they could be. More recently, about a year ago, Argon we received a. A major grant from the Department of Energy to do modeling and measurement across the city, but really focusing on six community areas um, to understand the impacts of climate change on vulnerable urban communities. So those uh, communities, uh, if I were to show you other maps of Chicago, we have an issue with um, the loss of the tree canopy over the last uh, uh, 50 years or so. There is a program now, it's a $50 million investment from the city to plant 10,000 trees to begin to restore uh, the tree canopy. Now, I won't, there's other work that I've done that I don't talk about today, but I'll just mention that we're also using AI in the urban planning process. So my postdoc, Anuj Tivari, we developed some um, vulnerability indices by county, by census tract, by whatever grouping zip code you, you wanna do. Um, and we developed um, a methodology for vulnerability indexing. We used this first with the state of Illinois to decide where to sample wastewater across a, um, across a major and mostly a rural region, the state of Illinois, as well as in Chicago. And more recently with the tree canopy program, we're looking at the impact of urban heat on uh, individual communities within the city. Because if you just think of this as a physical thing only, you may put tree canopy in places that don't actually improve the health of residents of the city. Maybe it'll make it in, you know, in the extreme case, it'll make, a, you know, a railroad yard or a factory area, uh, you know, more green. But where you really want to invest the, the money or the trees is in places where they're going to have the best impact on on the on the population. So this uh, use of AI for um, 
vulnerability indexing has been very important. We're also looking at flooding and, and other factors. The Crocus project then is really about climate change and they've partnered uh, the group. I'm part of the advisory committee uh, for that group at Argonne. Um, they partnered with us to provide them with the measurement infrastructure. All right, so what is it that we've done? So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the um, uh, what I think is a, a, a very beautiful uh, technological device, the, the Array of Things node in the upper left. Uh, we, we worked with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago to have a couple of goals in mind for these devices. One would be, and one of, the, one of them was that they would be friendly looking and inviting so that when people saw them, in contrast to the other surveillance and you know, cell phone tower and other devices junk that's up on the pole, they would be intrigued and want to know more about the project. On the right hand side, you can say we sort of, I wouldn't say we gave up on the aesthetics, but we decided these poles are ugly enough already. So, you know, we don't necessarily need to um, have these small devices that are so pretty. Uh, there, This is a, a, a Sage node, one of the more recent ones that, that we've been putting up. The ones in Chicago are not quite as ugly as this one. They do have blue boxes instead of white. But um, what I want to point out in this in this slide here, because um, I, I want to talk about some of the lessons learned of working with the city here with AI in the city is if you look at the one on the right, you can see that there's a, a surveillance camera underneath. It's it's obvious. If you want to if one look look on the one on the left, it's not clear, it's not obvious at all that there's a camera. We hid the camera not for nefarious purposes, but because cameras are ugly and we wanted a device that was nice looking. And I'll say that we we got a false sense of um a false sense of accomplishment, if you will, in working with the city on privacy and with the communities on privacy, because in five or six years that we had these devices up, and most of them, even though they're not running, are still up on the poles, we didn't get any uh any sort of um blowback or or um, um, or issues with privacy. People didn't seem like, it seemed like they trusted us. The first device that we put up on the right with the obvious camera generated the first response that said, what are you doing with this camera in our neighborhood? And we had talked to one of the neighborhood groups in this particular East Garfield Park is where it was on the west side of Chicago. Um, but we hadn't talked to all, you can't talk to everyone in a community. And so we realized that the form of the device really impacted in ways that we that are obvious now looking back that we didn't really anticipate. And that told us, you know, privacy and the the need for a harmonious relationship with the uh, residents of the city to do this kind of work is something that you just don't do in, in, in the beginning and, and say work is done. It's really something that's that's ongoing. You can see a couple of the sample images at the lower left from uh, the device that I'm talking about that's in the on the west side. And the purpose for that device was to monitor flooding. So I'll show you in a moment some examples of that. In the lower right, I'll talk about in a little more detail. That's the Microsoft and JC to Co partnership. There is a QR code. and I, I think that these slides will be available, but um, one of the papers that I talked about um, uh, is there. So why do we do AI? Why would we embed these intelligent devices in the city? In 2014, or actually 2012 to 2013, when we were first designing the idea of an array of things, we had this idea of 500 devices um, throughout the city. And we had this moment where uh, originally we weren't talking about cameras and then uh, all of the scientists groups that we worked with, somebody in each of those workshops, many workshops, would always say, look, you know, for my science, I really need to see what's going on. I need to analyze images. And so we realized we, we couldn't really do a project like the Array of Things without including uh, cameras if, if we didn't want to just leave a bunch of science undone. Um, so that brought us to this moment of panic, which is how would we imagine networking those devices so that we could get the camera images to somewhere we, we could analyze them? We, you know, we we knew we couldn't afford cellular. We also couldn't afford to make our own network. There was no universal Wi-Fi throughout the city. There still isn't in most of the places um, that these things go. And so it's really sort of like, okay, well, we don't have the bandwidth to bring the images back. So we're going to have to analyze them within the device. And as as we got to working on the project, we thought, hey, you know, this seemed like a bug at the beginning, but maybe it's a feature 
um, that we're forced to design a self-contained device. It doesn't care if it has network connectivity or not. It'll wait for the network to come back up and then send its data. Uh, but we can now, uh, we're forced into this position, at, uh, say 14 years, in 2014, we were forced into the position of really thinking about how do we design a device and, and, and things that we wouldn't have thought to do with a streaming network like LIDAR or hyperspectral images we can now think about how do we do those in a disconnected way where we use AI to interpret the data and decide what to save or what not to save. Uh, the low latency was, was an issue. Um, by this, I mean, if you if you have a device on a street corner and you have a, a, a program running in the cloud somewhere, for that device to make a decision, you've got to send the data over the cloud and back. And you're talking about 100 milliseconds at the end of the day if everything goes right. Well, 100 milliseconds is not fast enough to make a decision like I'm going to change the I'm going to change the lights at this intersection for safety reasons, or I'm going to send uh, a, a message to a connected vehicle. So we thought we've got to have low latency uh, at the corner if we're going to support research in in those areas. And and I'll talk more about uh, privacy and security. But the but the key here is that um, you know all of our privacy policies uh, you know. The real unique part of them uh, uh, is that uh, there are two things which I'll talk about in privacy, but is that one of them is that the data that we collect with the cameras is not persistent. We analyze the data and then we delete the data. So we get the information out of the image that we want, number of vehicles, whether there's flooding, but then the image themselves are uh, are deleted. So there's other reasons for AI um, at the edge, but these are these are some that are that are key for uh, for cities. The Sage project, which followed the array of things, is is beyond cities. I am part of the project and focused on cities, but we have a number of different software-defined sense. So, what I mean, what do I mean by software-defined sensing? There's been a term around for a while called software-defined radio, and that means a radio that you can define in a, in software the freak, not just the frequencies that it listens to, but the format of those frequencies to decode that information. So the same radio with one program can listen to the Mets on, you know, on AM radio or be programmed in a different way and listen to um, emergency messages or even cell phone, uh, make cell phone calls by formatting data in the way that cell phones are. So it's the frequency as well as the formatting of the information. All radios that you use or typically that you use are that's do that's done in hardware. So once you put the radio up, it only does AM radio. Once you put a software to find radio up, you can change what it does. So we thought this is a perfect way to describe the fact that when we put a camera up or a microphone, we have a sensor that we tell it what to do in software. We say, okay, well, right now we're going to have you look at images and classify the vehicles in those images. Or now we're going to have you look at those images and look at the cloud motion or even the types of clouds. So by changing the program, we turn the camera into this multi-capability uh, sensor and, and by software. So that's what we mean by software-defined sensor. And as I've been talking, you've been looking at these examples on, on the right. But I want to say the general approach that we've taken is this is a programmable infrastructure. And so there is effectively an app store with dozens of apps that people have written in our team and other teams that you can go and say, well, I'm I'm interested in pedestrian flow through this scramble crosswalk. And so I can just go and I can grab the software that's already there and maybe modify it for my purposes and then deploy it out on one of these devices. And so we have the We've built the infrastructure for that kind of experimentation over the past uh, eight or nine years of development. So let, let me just give you, you know, two visual and two audio examples. Sadly, um, for our purposes anyway, maybe not generally, but but for our purposes, we we are not allowed to use the microphones in the state of Illinois because there's a wiretapping uh, law. We can use microphones other places that we have devices, and so we're able to do that work. New York City, New York does not have a wiretap law, so you get these really nice projects like Juan Bellows' uh, Sounds of New York City, S-O-N-Y-C, or Sonic at NYU. Um, so at the bottom, these are examples from outside of the state of Illinois. The one on the left is a kind of a pretty way to look at 
use the use of convolutional neural networks or AI models to look to listen to um, listen to sound and classify according to uh, what sort of bird that we're hearing. And the algorithm that we use, and this is why I talk about our our infrastructure as general purpose. We're actually using algorithms from Cornell um, that that classify bird sounds. On the right-hand side, we're classifying sound events. Sound event like a crash or a boom at an intersection would tell you something interesting happened there, screech of tires or or horns honking or crowd noises or whatever. And so we, we were also uh, able to use um, and build on work at Cornell and NYU and other places uh, in that area. On the, up, uh, on the top there, uh, I, on the left-hand side, you can see this is a typical field of view of one of the sage nodes. It's about 28 feet, about uh, uh, eight, uh, eight meters or nine meters above, above the sidewalk. It's pointed at the middle of the intersection. And so you can see, we can see up uh, two of the streets and acro across the intersection. Um, I, I, uh, I'll give you an example in a moment of, of, of visual. Beyond the one on the right, which is uh, at NIU, Northern Illinois University, it's in DeKalb, Illinois, we have a node that undergraduates have been using to just track trace the path of pedestrians through an intersection and decide for public safety decide well whether we need to change the sidewalks if you see on the right hand side there there's no sidewalk there but or crosswalk sorry there but people use it anyway so maybe there needs to be a scramble here uh, or or a crosswalk uh, at that other place and that's an example of um pulling the information out in a privacy preserving way. All we know is that a person was walking in one direction or the other uh, through the intersection. Another example, and this is an issue in many cities, the only way that you know that you've got a flooding problem is somebody called 311. And so with a very you know low cost device, you can see on the right hand side, we've just got a frame by frame uh, analysis of the image to decide is there standing water or not. So you, you can kind of tell it's uh, it's time lapse there. So that's another example of the use of these these cameras uh, for urban uh, management purposes. So I want to highlight and then close so we can have time for for comments. Three things that um, we among the things we took away from this work. So so one is is that. Um, every location that we choose, we decided that three things needed to be true. Number one, the people in the neighborhood were interested in the same thing that we were, traffic safety, noise, pollution, whatever. <clears throat> so there was a, a common interest. Number two, that there were scientists that were interested in the data and that could actually provide some insight into that uh, data if we were to put a note, a device there. And number three, there had to be somebody in, in policy, local government, who, given insight into that particular issue, might actually be able to take some action. And so I'm not saying that action was taken on all of these, but I'm just saying that the rubric that we used to decide where to put these devices was based on these this sort of rule of three. Now, the other dimension you see on the left are specific projects, many of them from communities where they said, you know, we want to have a node here for this reason at this crosswalk for, you know, safety of kids. Uh, and so the, um, all the although the devices that we deployed here are identical, the different icons mean that the primary purpose for that device being there was to support that, that project, not exclusively, but to, to, to support that project. Okay, so I'm going to kind of motor through a few here. Um, the second is, it's really important that the data is not just available. The array of things data was available, but nobody in the community would know what to do with it. And so um, when the Microsoft folks approached me, I loved their their ideas about making the data not just available, but legible to community members. So each of these devices uh, on, you can see the one on the bus shelter, each of those bus shelters had this sticker that you see on the left, and you could hit that QR code and get a survey and you could take that survey and then you could get to the data and look at the history of today or yesterday or earlier this week of the place that you're standing or how it compares to the rest of the city. And, and um, as I said, this um, there's another paper that I'll, I'll send to Anthony and Hubert um, on the outcome and how that actually worked in terms of engaging the community. And the short answer is, 
it didn't work as well as we thought because it's really hard to engage communities. It's um, it's uh, it's a, a lot of people and 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 you want to find a way to get them, you know, to find common interests with them. Um, so I've mentioned some things with privacy. Um, our guiding principle you can see on the up, upper right hand side. On the lower left, you can see that we had it's a screen capture from one of a series of community meetings that we had around the city as we were developing the privacy policy and uh, starting two years before the first device went up. Our policy had has three different components. One is we think about how the technology uh, can be harnessed and um, in, in a in a privacy preserving way. Number two, we we built accountability in with external auditors and evaluators and advisors. Number three, we did this in a transparent way. If you go to that website, arrayofthings.org, and you go to the policy page, there's a report on our community engagement, including hundreds of questions we were asked, each of which got a response. The other thing I'd say down at the bottom here is that um, one of our strategies was to develop a policy that was not reliant on current limitations of technology. So we didn't have to say no facial recognition because our cameras weren't capable of that. And AI at the time wasn't capable, but we knew at some point cameras would be better, AI would be better. And so we we thought very carefully about how the, how things would evolve over, the, over time and whether our, our privacy policies were um, strategic and principled enough um, that they would they would be uh, they would withstand the advancement of, of technologies. Uh, some current projects uh, we're doing with the uh, Illinois Department of Transportation, looking at railroad crossings and bridges uh, in both cases to, to uh, classify the traffic. Uh, in the left-hand side, it's because there's $60 million worth of lost productivity in Chicago uh, due to people waiting at, at railroad crossings. The nice thing is we're the rail hub of North America. The the challenge is that that means lots and lots of like thousands of crossings. The one on the left is uh, uh, we're beginning to deploy devices in and around O'Hare International Airport uh, with the Department of Energy Transportation Research uh, and the Chicago Department of T Transportation to understand uh, traffic flow in and around the airport in a way to, that we could build a model and then um, uh, uh, and then begin to to look at uh, uh, interventions, if you will, to reduce private uh, traffic. So let me close by just saying um, what I didn't talk about was the past several years of of uh, working and editing uh, two reports on AI with about a thousand people across the country from national labs, universities, and industry, um, and and thinking carefully about how to use AI in science. And the subset of that, from me, from my point of view, is also uh, using AI in cities. Uh, something you know, you all saw this amazing thing happen a year ago when ChatGPT was released. And we saw this, if you, if you want to look at it scientifically, as soon as we had the computing power to train these models, albeit at cost of hundreds of millions of dollars, and you know, I don't know what the carbon footprint is, but it's big, um, we saw this inflection point in in many, many capabilities. This is a paper from, uh, from a, a group at, at Stanford. And you see it about uh, 10 to the 22nd. So uh, exasc exascale computers are 10 to the 18th floating point operations every second, a billion billion. Um, so this is a uh, hundred times uh, more or a thousand times more than that in terms of the number of, uh, you know, how how much training you did. And you, we saw this inflection point. We don't think that this is a new normal. We think that it was a... a uh, an inflection point, but we don't have the resources to try to go a thousand times faster because that would mean a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred months on a five hundred million dollar machine, and and you know only a few people have the resources to do that, and that's actually one of the concerns we have with these large AI models is that you have to have a lot of money to run them. Uh, you can see there's been an explosion though of the reuse of models and retraining of models in this this uh, family tree of models at the left. You can't read it, but each of the dot, the uh, ovals on the left-hand vertical scale are years. So we're at the top, and you can see how much has happened just in the last two years in terms of models being being available. So specific to cities, um, 
you know, it, the use of AI with cameras, facial recognition. In the lower right, this is a slide that I made two years ago. Um, I've had facial recognition in my house, you know, for two years. Um, using, you know, devices that are not very expensive. And so, you, you know, you can imagine what Starbucks and, you know, some of what, what companies like Amazon are doing with cameras in their stores. Um, and, and I really uh, feel like the, the key to understanding AI in cities and to grappling with the risks uh, and the potential misuse of AI is at the city level. We can't wait for federal, uh, you know, or EU legislation uh, because you know AI is already coming in cities, and I'll. I think this is my last slide here. Yeah, um, say this. Um, uh, this example on the right is from one of the you know Songdo in, in South Korea, one of their one of their reports, and and it's it's illustrative of the way that smart cities began, and maybe they've evolved since then. But with this idea that that cities are computers. Number one, cities are not computers, and there are lots of reasons you guys can give me more reasons than I can come up with. But number two, from a computer science point of view, that means that our smart city is a sort of the operating system of the city. And it's important for you to know that a good operating system, or actually any operating system that we know of, is a total authoritarian system. That is not what we want for cities. So I'll just close there, uh, uh, and maybe we'll have time for uh, for questions. And thanks again for having me. Thank you, Charlie. That was fascinating. Um, I have followed your work closely, and this is even a deeper dive into, into what you've been doing. Um, I would uh, invite anyone uh, in the audience to just raise your, do the Zoom, raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll invite you to um, come off uh, mute and share your question. Um, although I'm going to take moderator's uh, privilege and, and ask the first question. You know. This is a research network, right? And so I think you've demonstrated like what good looks like um, and also what effective looks like in the same package. And like, as I was I was listening to, I kept thinking, okay, I know that there's startups out there in the world that are taking this good approach, like companies like Numina here in New York City that we work with, but they're struggling and the market leaders are the ones that are sort of slashing and burning and scraping up as much data as they can. And I guess the question is like, do you think that there is some inherent like commercial advantage in a edge-based approach that um, you know is more thoughtful about flows of data and privacy um, akin to like what we saw with like packet switching and circuit switching in the early days of the internet that there's sort of like a cost but once you, you absorb that cost it gives you so much flexibility and capability that uh, and if not like how do we push the market towards a kind of better urban sensing infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that's a good question um, in several dimensions. So so one is that, uh, you know, even after 15 years ago, IBM put a billion dollars into a smart city effort. As I understand it, they decided there was no money to be made there. So I, I don't I don't know um, that we have cracked the the code on on how to finance these projects. It seems to me that there are creative ways to do it, but it it goes back to something I said before, which is that it has to involve policymakers. You, you know, as a startup uh, coming in, trying to sell something to the to the cities, even if you can afford the procurement process overhead, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, with respect to AI and privacy, uh, you know, the whole concept of software-defined sensors means that I, as a company or, or or as a project, I can put a device up that can uh, evolve over time. You know, like we never imagined that one of the applications would be deciding what percentage of people had face masks on. <laughs> it turned out that was an interesting number. We never got the number, but it was an interesting sort of thought experiment that we played around with during the during the lockdown. We decided it was it was an interesting but not that useful exercise outside, but it could be useful inside. No, none of our devices were inside. But this idea that you can put something up on a pole that can evolve and, and be adaptive, I think is a is a unique advantage over a traditional device that has a fixed set of capabilities. The real cost to it though, Anthony and others, is that um, the flexibility that you have and the cost for putting those devices up 
you can do so much with solar and battery powered like we did with Microsoft. Our devices, it's like three hours of a bucket truck to get the power up there. That's not necessarily the case today because we have the smart lighting program and all that. But still, when you have to plug a device in, which you do at the moment, if you want to do a, a, a reasonable amount of, of AI, that's a real cost. It probably won't be a cost two or three years from now, but it is it is today. Or if you want to be at the at the cutting edge. Uh, Noor, uh, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, I just have a question. So your project has been running since 2011 or 2012. Uh, maybe because I work in uh, urban planning, uh, I'm more, I would be more interested to see, uh, have you ever tried to observe changes with regard to land uses, for example, if certain shops have changed or new shops have opened? Did you change, uh, did you observe any changing in, for example, pedestrian flow? Uh, has the area become more interesting or has certain areas declined over those years? This kind of questions would be interesting to urban planning. I don't know if you have had the chance to explore such questions. Um, it, it is, yeah. So that's a good question. And even early on, one of our motivating, one of the things that motivated us to do this project was looking at the pedestrian counts for the Chicago Loop, the central business district, about a square mile central business district. And, and seeing, I, I saw this wonderful map that showed the, the number of pedestrians per hour or maybe as per day across the city and each segment was labeled. And then I noticed that it was from a two day survey in 2007. And so this kind of question that you're asking, it, it's super important to, you know, the, uh, the local business districts, uh, uh, in the city that want to draw uh, crowds. We didn't do any experiments with that, but it was one of the things that motivated us to have the capability to count the number of pedestrians. I'll say a lot of the things that I aspired to do like this kind of had to take a second uh, second place during at least the last, you know, most of the Array of Things project because we were so focused on making the device work from a computer science point of view that we weren't able to get the urban science done that we hoped we would do. Thanks, Charlie. Um, we have a question in the chat from Luis San, San Vicens, uh, and he asks, the fact that you do not store the whole data, only store and send the process data, uh, has helped you in order to get permits to, to allocate these devices? Uh, did city council understand this issue and agree to have these devices? Uh, so yeah. yeah, I think the question yeah. is right. Okay. Great, great question. Um, we had to, or early on, um, and it took about a year, we had to put in place a legal agreement between the University of Chicago and the city of Chicago. Now, these are not unique. I mean, I've done three of them for three different projects in as many years, but they are significant amounts of time, especially when you consider that the legal staff in the city government has at at all times they have way more projects to look at than 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 they can possibly look at so it's a matter of raising the visibility to the point within the city that they're willing to spend the time and an effort to make the agreement work our agreement has and you can um it's not um the, the policies are online the actual contract itself on a sort of case by case we can share it uh but it has a it the the po privacy policy which is on the web is the core piece of agreement with the city. Everything else was just standard terms and conditions, but that was the part that the city was most concerned about. Even down to the legal, the lawyer wanting to know what does it mean that you say you're going to delete? When are you going to delete? How long is it going to be in the device? So they really, really were zeroing in on that. So that was at the heart of. Um, and the way it worked in Chicago is we worked with the mayor's office where the chief technology officer is located. We worked with the chief information officer and, and her organization. And then they have a committee within the, the city council on technology. And this chief information officer has and chief technology officer. They have the leeway to do experiments um, uh, of this sort and get approval from that committee without having to go to the whole city council. 
I had a question. Um, if anyone in the group here or, or folks they know are interested in um, doing some development or deployment of either a sensor network or applications within the Sage platform, what are what are the entry points for that? Are, the, are those materials open source or like what's involved in putting one of these up for a researcher um, or student? So this, there's two two sort of two questions I'll separate. So the first is, uh, let's say I just want to do some research in, like Nora's question, I want to do some research in in counting pedestrians over time and and, and traffic flow. Um, you would go to the SAGE website, sagecontinuum.org, and look at the documentation. You could learn all that you need to learn about what applications are available and how to adapt them to your purpose. And then there is a a, a form that you would fill out that says, I want to run this application on these nodes. Maybe I just want to run them on, on five nodes. Maybe I want to run them on, you know, a hundred. Uh, and, and so there you become a user of the Sage system and, and um, everything is documented. Everything's open source. You can take our applications and run them anywhere you want. One thing we did between Array of Things and Sage is Array of Things was a bespoke computing system. Um, the Sage device, it's using virtual computing. So it's it's like a little cloud in that you can submit a fully contained, what's called a container with your application to the device and not have to learn all the specifics of, of the device itself. So it's very simple to do that. To get a node, so far all of the nodes uh, for the Sage project have been part of the Sage funding, uh, but the, the team has been working on a um, a more systematic way to sell, if you will, those devices to other projects. The one one way that we did it with a Illinois Department of Transportation project, which was external to the Sage project, was a separate grant, is that we worked out an arrangement where that project paid the Sage project a certain amount of funding for a measurement as a service, if you will. So they didn't have to buy the hardware. We deployed it for them. We built it for them. And that was easier because in this case, the Illinois Department of Transportation said, we don't want to own any equipment. Uh, so so there are lots of ways to work with the team on that. And, and they're working on systematizing that uh, in a little bit better form. Great. Um, looks like we have two quick questions, which I'll get up before, before we break. Um, Nancy Minoj, uh, did you want to jump on or I guess I'll just read it if they're in the chat. With the Array of Things device, were there any public engagement initiatives, especially when people started noticing the camera? And if so, how did you go about it? You know, we, we did public engagement and we still do at the at the front end of a deployment. We, you know, Chicago has, you know, dozens of wards, each of which have aldermen uh, in charge. We wanted to make sure that uh, the alderman was aware of the device going into their neighborhood. So a lot of the community engagement kind of went through the alderman organization. Um, in other cases, we've worked with with uh, environmental justice organizations that are either community specific or multi-community. Uh, so it's, it's always tricky um, knowing how to talk to the neighborhood, short of going out with a bullhorn and up and down the streets, which isn't very effective, I, I, got, I, I would imagine. Um, and so after the devices went up, we did, I mentioned the one thing that happened on the west side there, we haven't had a repeat of that, but maybe because people are now sort of, they see cameras all over, and so we're not any different, um, and if they were to ask about it, they would find out that we actually have a privacy policy we can show them, um, uh, but uh, what we, yeah, so we don't do an ongoing thing, but we do uh, every time we we do an expansion or an installation. We thought about putting QR uh, uh, stickers with QR codes on the pole be below the devices. And if we were to start getting more questions, we'd probably go ahead and do that. Um, thank you for that. Let's um, let's wrap up with Uber's question, which is uh, kind of hearkening back to a presentation we had last year from the Telram project in Belgium which was like a citizen crowdsourcing video traffic analytics network. Um, and, you know, this big question of like, is urban sensing going to become cheap enough that people can just throw 
you know, device in a window and plug into a network like Sage and start to see some real kind of returns to scale. What's your uh, your hunch based yeah, on? I didn't show well, I didn't show you the work that we're doing in very low cost. We have a, we actually have a student kit um, that does AI and is is like one or two hundred dollars, which is expensive for a student, but um, a lot less expensive than these devices. So I do think that we are going to see more and more community based projects, and there the trick will be to make sense of the data. I mean, you can. I have air quality devices in my house. I have, you know, every room has a, a, I made these things that cost me like $8 worth of parts. And I, I keep track of temperature and humidity in every room of the house and in the garage and outside. Um, but not knowing the, the deployment details, if you just say, hey, at my house, the, you know, ozone is through the roof or less out. At my house, the PM 2.5 is 300 parts per billion, which is like a bad day in Beijing, right? Well, in my house, that'd be because I was using the walk. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the neighborhood. It's a, it's like indoor measurement. When I use the walk, mm -hmm. my PM 2.5 goes way up because I'm essentially burning food. So not knowing where those devices are, the way that we, we can overcome that limitation is by working with community groups and giving them sort of advice and best practices on if you can secure yourself a few tens of thousands of dollars, here's a good way to do it. You know, have people hang them out their windows or what have you, mm -hmm. keep track of their location. So I, I think that's gonna, I think that's gonna really ramp up that being community sensing over the next few years. And and the Crocus project I mentioned at Argon, that's one of the main focuses there, weather and, and air quality sensors uh, at homes. Yeah, it really raises a lot of interesting questions about the challenges of, of digital literacy in a world of urban resilience and climate adaptation. So maybe maybe we'll take that topic on uh, next year for season three. Um, well, I, let me once again, thank you, Charlie, for joining us. This has been fascinating. Um, I dropped a link in the chat to Urban AI's uh, YouTube playlist, which has all of last year's presentations as well as this year's and will be added as we go on. Uh, and we will be back again um, next Tuesday at the same time to uh, learn about how AI is being used for anticipatory government in cities with Nissan Saran from Can Forecast. Um, thank you everybody for, for joining and have a good day. Thank you.